Genesis chapter 8, verse 2. Okay, so this, this first word is interesting. So, Sachar, this is actually some, quite a few scholars believe that this word, Sachar, Hebrew, Sachar, is related to Sagar, with a gimel instead. Sagar is to close, right? Like I could say, Sagoet Adelet, Bavakasha, please close the door. Right, and so there's this idea of closing, stopping up, plugging up. What? This is like the water sources of Tehom of the deep. Now this is quite interesting. So this is the Septuagint translation of the same verse. And this word, Sahar here, this is where I put LXX different, the Septuagint is different. They use a different word, Epikalufthesan, which is related to the word Kalupto, which is like to hide something, right? And it's to hide, to cover it over, something like this. And it's quite interesting because this word, it's, uh, I think it's, maybe 11 times in the Tanakh used, and it usually has this other meaning of covering sin, for example. Covering over sin. And as we've been drawing the parallels out from this week's Torah portion, and connecting them to the apostolic writings a bit in a bit, building a piece at a time, these concepts we already saw from the Targumims about the Memra, right, and about his by means of his mercy, right, the attribute of mercy, which some believe Yeshua is an emanation of his mercy. And uh, and now we're seeing, if we understand the great flood, it's kind of like, <laughs> I was thinking about this, it's like a mikvah for the world, right? The world is having a mikvah. The world is getting purified. All of the world. If you remember from last week, we discussed the opinion in the tar in the uh, the Talmud, Tractate Sanhedrin, page one, is it 118 or 108? I can't remember. Anyway, in that, in that realm, on the back side of the page, it discusses this concept that some of the sages, they believed that even the animals had become perverted. For example, they were eating each other, which does not seem to be the original plan in the garden, right? We have this, this heavenly concept of everything is at peace. All of creation is even at peace in the Garden of Eden. Right? Man did not kill anything other than plants. Yeah, plants. Who cares about them? <laughs> right? All, and, and even then, we're not sure if he killed the plants or he just harvested from them. Right? I'm not sure that he had to had to destroy even any plant, but just to take the berries, to take the corn, etc. And the animals also. And the evidence for this, rather than just a position of silence, we're not saying that just because the Bible doesn't comment on this, part of the evidence of this we can see in the prophetic paintings of what Olam Haba, Hebrew Olam Haba, the world to come, will be like. The lion will lay down with the lamb and all of these sorts of things. You have a, you have a predator that's laying down with the prey, right? They're friends. They're chilling, right? And so we expect kind of a return to these things in paradise, this situation. And so for the sins that the animals did, I also, we also shared it last time about, you know, some of the animals were engaged in strange things, intermating between species. The wolf would stand before, pardon me, the, the dog would stand before the wolf, you know, etc. So now we have the entire world is mikvah. And I can't reference this. I haven't seen this anywhere. So if anybody's read this in any of the Jewish literature, please let me know. I'd love to have a reference to support this idea. A lot of times I come up with an idea, and then I find it supported, right, in wherever. <laughs> and so, yay, that's like a confirmation, right? Like, the grammatical concept that I push in the first part of my book that I've shared with you guys, Bereshit, meaning in a beginning, not in the beginning. That grammatically, it's in a beginning. And then I made my case grammatically from the Greek in the Septuagint, and the Greek in the writings of John, right? And just really made the case that it's from a grammatical standpoint, it really is in a beginning, right? There have been multiple beginnings. And then I found support from the sages for it, right? Turns out that Rashi says this is not the way you would say in the beginning. You would say, Barishona, 
right? You wouldn't say Bereshit, right? This would not be the normal way to communicate such a thing. We found support from Midrash Rabbah that says that Hashem, actually it says HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Blessed One, uh, the Holy One, blessed be He, that He continued creating and destroying and creating and destroying until He was pleased with what He had created, right? And so there's, it's interesting, we have Midrashic support, we have rabbinical support, and we also have linguistic support that there were multiple beginnings. And so, this idea of, I think there might be some merit to this, you guys can push back if you like, with the idea of the world receiving a mikvah, right? Because rainwater is considered usable for purposes of mikvah in a certain time period, right? So it purifies all the living beings. Of course, those that died, okay. <laughs> but for those who survived, in a way they had gone through this symbolic mikvah, this symbolic baptism, if you will. And so this, of course, is going to connect us again to the mikvah experience that we find, the conversion experience, when someone comes to Adonai <laughs> and they purify themselves. They, maybe they're entering Judaism, for example, through their mikvah, or maybe they're just going through a normal monthly purification process, but it's there with us. Jane writes, today we're going through baptism of fire. Yeshua baptized with water, the Ruach with fire. Yeah, true. <coughs> okay, so let's continue on then. And the lattices, this word Aruba. Aruba, Bermuda, da 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 Bahamas, Mamas, da da Okay, sorry. Beach Boys have struck in. But Aruba, it's like a lattice. A lattice, or a network of holes. Right? Like, several... Well, Aruba is a hole, and then several together, it's like a, a window lattice. Like, you might see on the top of an ancient Middle Eastern house to allow the air to flow through and kind of control the flow. But it could also be a network of holes, for example. And so this is saying the lattice of the heavens, or the heavenly lattice, the, the, the lattice in the sky. We don't really know if there was a membrane or something like this that held the water above the earth in those days. Okay, so this, this verb is acting on two things. It's saying he shut the waterways of the deep, meaning under the ocean, and also the lattices in the sky. Vayikalei. Hageshem, and he, he restrained, this word means, rest, uh, pardon me, this is Nephal, you see the little dot there, so passive, and was restrained the rain, the Geshem. So I want to come back to the Sakhar for a moment. Sakhar. So as I mentioned, it's, it's, I can't remember if it's 11 or 19, but it's, I checked it out, and the other places where it's used in the Septuagint, they have this concept of covering sin, right? This sort of stuff. And so I thought, okay, let's use our rabbinical Gazera Shava method and see how it ties to the apostolic writings. And it turns out it's only one place, this word in the apostolic writings. And here it is. It is in the letter written to the congregation in Rome, commonly called Romans, chapter 4, verse 7. And it's interesting that the apostle Paul, Rav Shaul, he is quoting Psalm 31.1 here. So the Greek says, Makaroi hon afefesan, hai amon, pardon me, anomiai, kai hon epekalufthesan, hai amartia. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds, that's the anomiai, are forgiven, and whose sins are covered. Right, so this is Anomia. We talked about this before, but I wanted to bring it back to memory again. Last week we mentioned Yeshua talking to the people who praise him in name only, right? The lip sayers, right? I'm not praising, but give him credit. I meant by that, like the lip sayers. Lord, Lord, did we do these things in your name? Did we cast out demons, heal the sick, blah, blah, blah? And what does he say? Depart from me, you doers of Hebrew avon, intentional sin. Right? Or rather, Anomia. Anomia. And here we have it in the Greek, anomia. Ah. This means not. Okay, sorry, it's not coloring. There we go. Ah. And then nomia. This is from nomos. 
right? You all know nomos, meaning law, right? And that's just a plural form. Lawless deeds. Those of you who have done lawless deeds. And so here we have this. Paul is saying, blessed are those who have, whose transgressions against the Torah, is one way to think about it. Those who have been eating squid, right? Those who have been been working on Shabbat on, the, on Saturday or Friday night. Those who have been visiting cemeteries to have a picnic, right? Those who have been you know, doing all these sorts of things, like just <laughs> things that are not allowed in the Torah, we're supposed to avoid, that they are forgiven. Right? That's his first part, afetheisan, right? Blessed are those who, who are forgiven. What is forgiven? Their lawless deeds. And those who are, I hamartiai, this is Hebrew, chataot, sins, that the sins, so this is a general category of sins, it could be all sins, right? Or it could be probably accidental sins here, because we have avon, like acting intentionally to sin, that that's been, i.e. going against the Torah, even though we read the Torah. And then we have accidental sins, and also whose accidental sins, is probably how I would have translated that, because this word maps to Hebrew chata, which when it's, again, 3,000 meters in the sky, when it's all alone, it just means sin. Right? You can just say any kind of sin. It's like a category of sin. But when we pull it down to earth, and there's another Hebrew word from the same genre, i.e., here in this case, amomia, right? Lawless sins, i.e., probably avon, right? Doing avon, intentional sin, intentional actions against the Torah, then the nuance of the word is accidental sins. So the one who did intentional sins, avon, and the one who did accidental sins, Chaita, or also it shows up as Chata'at, that this person blesses one who has had the first one forgiven, and the accidental ones have been covered. Covered. So does everybody see the connection here? So through the flooding of the world, through the use of Mayim Chaim, Hebrew Mayim Chaim, <coughs> God has blotted out the iniquity, he has blotted out the guilt that was stored up in the world, and now he covers over the natural reaction to sin, which is death. <coughs> in this case, water. The very substance required for life is used for death. Does someone have their camera on? I thought I didn't allow that. I don't think I allowed it. Yeah, be aware if you accidentally have your camera on. Ted says we're not listening. <laughs> Does that mean you can't hear me? You hear me, right? Okay, okay. <laughs> well, I wouldn't listen to me either if I were you. <laughs> so, you see the connection? It's it's quite amazing. And so we get this same word being used by Paul, quoting from the psalm, about covering over of accidental sins. This is, I think, really a good example of this would be for the, for the Goyim, who they didn't realize that they had to keep these things. They didn't realize that they had to keep the Torah. They didn't know. So it wasn't an avon, it wasn't intentional in this case, it really becomes accidental, right? Because of their status of being kidnapped since birth. So he restrained the rain, min hashamayim, from the sky. <coughs> so regarding the restraining, the Torah mentions this to tell us that not even normal rainfall still occurred during this period when the earth returned to normal. So this is the opinion of Rabbi Kimchi and also of Tur HaAroch. Sarna writes, the phenomena described in chapter 7 verse 11 of 
Genesis are abruptly terminated. So that's when it starts, right? That's when the death and destruction starts. Back in chapter 7, verse 11. It's interesting. Remember a couple weeks back, I was sharing with you how the Bible story of the flood is very different, even the creation story. The creation story is very different from even similar pagan stories. In similar pagan stories, in, in the case of Breshit, with the pagans, nature itself almost has a mind, right? It represents certain gods, like the Egyptians, they worshipped the Nile and these sorts of things, right? Because they saw these things, they worshipped the sun, right? These other aspects of nature, they worship them as being the ones that are giving the life, the, being the ones that are causing the crops to grow, being the ones that are causing them to be safe, you know, the natural mountains that are protecting them on another side, these sorts of things. Whereas in the creation account of the Torah, it's the opposite. Hashem is in charge. He's doing everything. He might give some power to nature. For example, here's the genus. Go make species from this genus, right? That's here, but here I've set it in motion. But still, it's clear that the one who's giving any kind of authority, any kind of power, is God. So we mentioned, if you remember, several partials back, we mentioned that God in the Bible, it's a polemic. The, the biblical story is a polemic against the goyim in those times, the pagans in those times. The Bible is saying, you got it all wrong, guys. This is how it happened. God alone is making these things happen, either by doing it directly himself or giving power to someone else to, or, so, or nature itself to continue the process. It all comes from God. It's not like... And, and today we also have another polemic, another attack on the pagan stories. We, we have from the Mediterranean, various cultures of the Mediterranean and their flood myths, they, they have... For example, they have uh, in, they have the story of the gods themselves. They unleash the flood, and then they're horrified at what they've done. Right. So here, here, let me read this. Sarna elucidates very well. So the phenomena which started the flood are, abrupt, are abruptly terminated, thus underscoring that everything issues from God's sovereign will and is under His undisputed control. This is in sharp contrast to the limitations imposed upon the gods, lowercase g, by a mythological polytheistic system. The subservience of the gods to nature and their singular lack of freedom are vividly demonstrated in Utmapishtim's account. He means the flood account. Once the flood started, the gods were terror-struck at the forces they themselves had unleashed. They were appalled at the consequences of their own actions over which they no longer had control. They were, quote, frightened by the deluge, that's the Mabu, and they cowered like dogs crouched against the outer wall. Ishtar cried out like a woman in travail. Okay, so you see this. Even in Greek mythology with the Titans and this sort of stuff, you see even this, the most powerful god is fearful that something might happen to him. The god of the Bible is never fearful. Now, I will, I will share with you, it's kind of a pet peeve of mine to hear the, the, the saying, God is in control, right? Someone's having a problem and someone responds, oh, God is in control, right? As if God himself, in that instance, is the one sending the pain and suffering, which is not always the case, right? It's not always the case. We live in a fallen world. Humans have some control too, don't they? In this concept that <coughs> that the Holocaust was God's plan, that, that he wanted his people to suffer in this manner, I think is just outrageous. I could not serve such a God who delighted in, in torturing his own people, right? As some choose to interpret the Isaiah prophecy about the suffering servant. The idea that the women and the children and you know and even like the rabbis and the very religious people that that they all had to be they all had to be tortured in such a manner. This is the doing of men. This is what you get when you get free will. You get some that choose the right way and some that choose the wicked way. And there's no way around it. If you want to allow free will, as our God has done, <coughs> there will be evil. The, the concept you might have heard some of the theologies they you know following after the the wicked Calvin Yamach who had people burned at the stake who disagreed with him 
over there in Switzerland. You know, you know, I don't know if you know this this one of the founders of Protestantism. He was a predestination believer. This idea that everything is created well, rather people are created, some for heaven and some for hell. Right? So so God himself has created some people to be destroyed. Right? There's nothing they can do about it. It's predestined. God has planned it that way. I think this is a horrible, horrible theology. A wicked, a wicked way to see things. That God would create a little baby, right? With the idea that, oh, you're going to get aborted, right? <laughs> you would allow it to have, or you're going to get burned, or your parents are going to get burned at the stake because they believe differently than Mr. John Calvin, right? So it's just ludicrous. Instead, you have a master plan, and God interferes when his master plan is threatened, right? When he wants to make something happen. Sometimes he sends a miracle, right? He can, he can use the forces of nature for his purpose, like we saw in the flood that has happened. But there is not a predestined robotic control of each human being. What's the purpose then? What would possibly be the purpose of creating people to be his imagers, to do his will here, if you're going to create some of them just to suffer for eternity? <laughs> Can you imagine such a wicked God? I'm going to make this one to suffer for trillions of years. Oh, it's going to be, it's going to be great torturing him. It's just, it's not a pleasant God. It's not a just God. You know, the the religion of peace has this idea. There's there's a hadith that discusses Moses is mad with Adam. And he says, oh, Adam, why did you do this to us? Why would you sin against Allah and cause this to happen to us? And then Adam retorts. He says, how can you say this to me? Forty years before I was born, Allah predestined that I would sin against him. You see, there's the same concept of predestination. We find this in many evil thought systems, many evil religions. This idea that God could be so wicked to create someone to sin against him, right? To create someone to deserve punishment. That person has no choice. But instead, a much more, a better way to look at the creator is that he wants his family to show true love. He wants his family to choose him. He wants individuals to love him with all of their mind so that they get involved in even Torah study and they, they figure out because of their love for him with their mind, because of loving him with all of their mind, as we say twice a day in the Shema Ve'ahavta, they choose then to do his law, to learn his law, to study Hebrew, to do all these things, even though they're not because they're easy, but because they are difficult to express love to him, that every day we choose him. Every day we choose him. Psalm 32, 1. What is that, Aida? What are you referencing there? Should I put that up? That, is that the English Psalm for Psalm 31, 1? Yeah, sometimes the numbering of the Psalms is different, right? So, because um, the numbering... So in the Septuagint, there are 151 Psalms, right? And so sometimes the numbering, the Christian Bibles, they usually go with the numbering of verses and chapters that are in the Septuagint, in the Greek, even for the Tanakh, for the Old Testament. So sometimes we get verses are off. Yeah, or I don't know if you're wanting to reference a different Psalm there, or if that's just, you're talking about this reference here to 31.1. Yeah, so sometimes even the chapter is different than the Hebrew. Uh, let's see, Maravik says, what about selection, division, and election? Yeah, this is a this is a very good question. Well, of course, in the apostolic writings, <coughs> there are a number of verses that make it seem like everything might be predestined. Otherwise, you wouldn't get groups that believe in this concept. You know, the Calvinists believing in predestination. <coughs> really, what is happening is that the election that's referred to often is talking about being born Jewish, for example, right? At least I think this is the roots of it, right? So in those days, when the whole earth were pagans, it was such an advantage to be born a Jew, right? Or to be born from any of the other tribes, right? Any of the tribes of Israel. What an advantage, because we would then be surrounded by his word. It would be part of the culture. You know, if you live in Israel, you eat kosher accidentally. <laughs> you know, so just by being in the culture, it's hard to find pork. It's hard to find shrimp paste. You know, it's hard to find clams. It's hard to find crab, right? It's hard to find that stuff. 
You have to go to some specialty Gentile hole in the wall grocery store to get that stuff, right? But if you go to the normal stuff, they don't have it at the normal grocery stores. You walk in you know, the normal chain grocery stores, they don't have that non kosher stuff. And so, even if you're not a religious person, even if you grew up on a kibbutz and you have no idea about Torah, right? You're just like a, a socialist or something, you're still obeying many of his commands. Many things are closed on Shabbat, right? So you can be more tempted to relax and chill at home. If you live in Jerusalem, nothing's open on Shabbat. Right? There's nobody driving around. If you drive your car, someone might throw stones at your car. So it's in your own self-interest to not do those things. So I think that this a lot of the election stuff, uh, even though it does get expanded by Paul, a lot of it stems from the idea of being Israel, right? Being born as a ben or bat Yisrael. And then later, as we start to have the shift with the uh, the understanding that we get from Paul's letters and, and other of the letters, like to Hebrews, we're not sure who wrote that one, and some of the other letters, then this concept is, is expanded, of course, because people who were born Gentiles are now becoming grafted in, right? Which is conversion language. They're converting and joining Israel, as was the plan in the beginning when Abraham was called out with Lech Lecha, get yourself up and go. The vehicle, right after God divorced the nations and he let the, the 70 principalities rule over them, the 70 sons of God, he calls out Abraham, in those days Avram, to begin the, the vehicle that would be used to save the world, not just by believing in the Messiah. It's not just that, it's not this Gentile explanation and sometimes Messianic explanation that what that means is that the, the Messiah would come from Israel. That's not the limit of it. The Messiah would be the gateway to allow others to join our nation in a much more rapid process, rather than the conversion that took one to three years in those days, and then you get the mikvah, and then you're a Jew, Mazel Tov. Instead of that, just accepting of the Messiah opens the door, and the conversion progress starts. That's why the apostolic writings say Moses is taught every day in the synagogues, so there's not as much emphasis put on reteaching those things that people are already learning in the synagogues. Even the righteous Gentiles who are going to the synagogues, they're hearing Moses. Instead, here's the proper interpretation of many things. And so let me see, there's more written here. Let me follow up here. Okay. Uh, okay. Tet follows up. Oh, by the way, let me follow one more thing here. Remember, we're told also that there is no more, that the mechitza, the dividing wall, has been torn down from Gentiles and Jews. Why? Because Gentiles are becoming Jews. <laughs> See? That's why it's torn down, through faith in the Messiah. The wall is still there. Paul's not saying that, like, uh, for example, polytheists. You can't sit down and have a meal with a polytheist. You're not supposed to. I mean, at their house, or the, the one that produced it, right? Or in a polytheistic... It's, you know, if you go to... If you like Thai food, for example, well, you're probably out of luck, because most restaurants have a statue of Buddha. So it's not kosher. You can't eat there. There's a statue of Buddha. You're not allowed, right? You can't do that. Or if you like, if you like Indian food, you have to be careful and be sure. You might say, "Oh, but it's vegetarian. It's okay." No, you have to make sure they're not offering some of that food to ganoush in the back. Although Baba ganoush is quite good. <laughs> Sorry for the pun. Is it Ganesh? Maybe their god is Ganesh, the elephant one with all. <laughs> The elephant-headed god, Ganesh, not Ganesh, right? Okay. Whereas Baba Ganesh is a nice Lebanese dish. Okay, so a lot of it comes, a lot of the confusion about the elect comes from not understanding what it means to be Israel. If you are grafted in and then you have children, your children have this advantage of election, you see? They're born as sons or daughters of Israel. They are part of the culture. They will be inundated with kosher food and, and Shabbat and the Moedim and all these sorts of things. This is the advantage that they have. They won't have to go through like you went through. If you had to go through graphic, first try this denomination and then that one and then that and then get fed up maybe with Christianity altogether for a while and then come back and then reread the Bible with fresh eyes. And, oh, he blessed the Sabbath. Right, as we have in the very last verse of the first Torah portion in the triennial cycle, that God bless the Sabbath. You know, people, they had to go through so much to get to this place. But depending on your age, your children or your grandchildren will not have to.